And then please confirm if you can see my screen. <coughs> can you see my screen with the document? Yes. Yes, we can. Thank you. So I'll just go through in the files in terms of what are these documents and uh, when you're going to use these documents. We've got the first one. I will not open them as yet because we're going to open them as we go along. The summative assessment, you don't look at it right now because we use that document at the end uh, of, our, our, of our session. Most probably you can start looking at it after Friday, the summative assessment. But I would specify in terms of uh, how do you go about taking that one uh, as you go along. And then we also have the learner guide. The learner guide is more like your textbook. It's more like your, 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 your book that you'd be referring to in terms of wh what is the content of the assessor course or the assessor unit standard. And then you also have the learner workbook. In the learner workbook, as we complete the unit, you need to complete the workbook whereby it would be testing your understanding uh, with regards to each and every unit that you complete. Let us say we complete unit one today. Tomorrow, please start working on this learner workbook in terms of completing the, the necessary questions that you will find on your learner guide. And you will find on the presentation that uh, I will conduct right now. So as you work with your, as you work with your learner workbook, you also contact your, 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 your learner guide because your learner guide is the one that has content of your, of your, of your assessor course. And then we also have the portfolio guide. So the portfolio guide, that one we will use as well, maybe towards the end of um, our uh, session. That one talks to the practical assessment that you will create uh, as you will become the assessor, not the student at that stage. And then you will have uh, two students of your own that you will be working with. And also you will create your own question uh, or like your, your own tool to assess uh, those students uh, of your own because you'll become the assessor uh, for those students. And then as well, I also have a register uh, that is there. Uh, if you are using uh, your Gmail, there is a folder that is there, which means every time we complete a session, you will complete your details and also uh, indicate uh, whether you are present or absent. You just put present. Uh, because if, uh, if we, we, we can't sign, if we try to sign with it, our digital signatures, it can maybe end up messing it up. I just want to give you an opportunity on that to register. You'll open it and you complete your details and then you save it and you leave it there. We're all going to use the same uh, register. Uh, it would be available for all of us to complete on that one. And then the last document, SAQA. The SAQA 11573, that is the unit standard code for the assessor code, which means everything and anything that we are learning today or uh, throughout the, the, the course is this SAQA document. And then I'll talk about what is SAQA and why is it important and all that and why is it there. So these are the documents that are very important for you uh, to actually work with. And then let us say you don't have a printer, but you do have a laptop to work with. I also cre have created uh, some word format in terms of your uh, learner workbook uh, of which you will complete uh, as a soft copy. Or if you, you are able to print, you can just print it out. Uh, but to save paper, you can just type it uh, or, or on that word document. 
uh, to respond quickly uh, and easily. But uh, it also can be the best if you have resources and you can just print it out and then you, you can complete it uh, uh, using your handwriting and stuff like that. So I don't know before I continue further, if you have any questions so far. You can just raise, raise your hand and then I'll allow you to go. Okay, which means uh, everyone is good. So far, so good. Okay, let me just share my presentation now for the day. Please confirm if you can still see my screen as well. No, I don't. So, I also don't see it. Okay. I don't see it too. How about now? You can see it. I can see it. I can see you. Now. Okay. Uh, the full name of the assessor course is called Conduct Outcome Based Assessment and it's unit standard 115.753. So what does that mean? Uh, if you can recall, you recall that uh, there was an era of outcome based uh, uh, assessment and outcome based education. Uh, this is the era whereby uh, everything uh, according to SACWA, was aligned based on when you teach someone, you teach someone based on certain outcomes that you want to achieve. And when you assess someone, you assess someone based on the outcomes that were taught uh, by maybe a teacher or maybe by a lecturer, depending on the uh, on on any particular thing. So this type of assessment. That is why it's very important because we are in an era whereby we are controlled by SACWA and SACWA believes in uh, outcome based education uh, and uh, it can be in the skills as well. You also find that whatever uh, has to be taught, there must be a certain outcome that should be achieved uh, uh, to the learner in the learning. So, what are we doing here? We are assessing the outcome uh, that we're taught. Uh, that is why you have the learning outcome and subject outcome in our latest curriculum for most of the programs that are offered in the education sector. Uh, with regards to the organization that is offering this, we are accredited by ECTP CETA because this unit standard fall under a CETA. So if you get certification, you get certification from CETA. Uh, CETA is within government. And the organization is registered. And also we do have some accreditation with other CETAs like CET CETA, et cetera, et cetera. But this one is focusing mostly on um, ETDP CETA accreditation. All right. What are the outcomes now? that we need to achieve within the program because as we are learning outcome based assessment but within this particular uh, uh, course or program there are outcomes as well that we need to achieve one of the outcomes uh, is based on you getting understanding in terms of the background important concepts that are within the this particular uh, unit standard, which is conduct outcome based You need, in order to drive a car, first of all, you do learners. So within learners, you learn a lot of theories and a lot of rules, a lot of concepts. So the first unit, it, 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 it allows you to gain certain understanding 
some of the things you'll be familiar with, uh, some of the things might be new, and some of the things might be, you have a lot of questions in terms of what does that mean and how does it work, you know, like, the ways of maybe you are familiar with the concept of RPL, but you don't really know the insight of that. So within the first outcome, we look at a number of uh, concepts and uh, theory that is within the assessment uh, section. And then the second outcome is looking at, are you able to prepare for assessment? So it, 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 its aim is for preparation for assessment. Maybe start looking at what is it that you need to do when you prepare for the assessment? What are the resources that are, are, are required? What is it that you do with your students when you prepare for the assessment? So that is the outcome number two. Outcome and number three, we look at the conduct. So let's say you're conducting an assessment. What is it that you need to take care of? Uh, you're offering a training, and then there's a room for training. Now you are assessing, is that room that you train your student relevant to, to the assessment that you'll conduct? The answer will be yes or no. So we look at the conduct of the assessment. And then uh, the outcome for look at how do you provide feedback on assessment or, um, or appeal when one wants to appeal? And the last one, uh, we review assessment. It's very important to do reflection when you, you do something. It can be you are teaching or you are assessing, but at the end of the day, we have to review in terms of whether what we start from the beginning, from your preparation to, to your feedback, what went well and what did not uh, go, go well. So those are the very important aspects. Uh, the last one, uh, take you back in terms of what did you do from the beginning up until now, and uh, what is it that you need to, to 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 improve on, and what is it that you did well on, and that we must keep exactly like it is. And then um, maybe let's just go straight into it because uh, there's a lot that I would like to share with you in terms of these particular this particular learning unit. Because today we're just going to look at this learning unit one, where it looks at demonstrating or demonstrate understanding of outcome based assessment, where you look at the number of concepts. But within the learning unit, uh, there are uh, outcomes that come within it as well, because there are sub categories uh, that also unpack it into details in terms of what is it that you need to look at. Uh, the first one, we need to compare uh, some outcome piece uh, with another form of assessment. The second one, we we'll look at RPL, we explain it, what are the benefit challenges, uh, who does RPL, uh, when is when are you required to do RPL, things like that. And then the third one, we look at different types of uh, assessment methods uh, that maybe you might need to conduct. And then uh, uh, number four, you look at the key principles of assessment because there are principles, ethics that define a reliable, a proper assessment that you need to conduct. And then lastly, we look at the approach of um, giving feedback. Mind you, in this unit, we're trying to describe, we're trying to give you some understanding so that when you are out there, you have a little bit of foundation and the understanding in terms of where does this come from and what does it mean. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll now stop and attend you. Uh, I'll continue talking. Okay, so when we are trying to come do some comparison between uh, outcome based uh, and maybe another uh, uh, assessment of learning, so in this instance, we try by all means to explain some key concepts that are within uh, the outcome based uh, assessment. And then you, maybe some of them you are familiar with and some might be new, uh, you might need some clarity. Uh, first of all, within the outcome based 
education or assessment, there's an element of uh, MQF. You need to understand what is MQF and why MQF is important because M M MQF is more of a um, set of principles and guidelines that provide the vision and a philosophical base and organization structure for qualification system. As you notice that when you do a course, there's always a question of on which NQS level is that particular uh, qualification? Because that is a philosophy that has been created in terms of a structure uh, for our qualification system in South Africa per se. So if your qualification does not fit in within NQF level one up to NQF level 10, uh, it, it's not uh, recognized or, or I'm not going to say a proper, and not a recognized qualification within the framework, the, the qualification framework. Uh, where does it come from? It comes from the, the, the South African Authority, uh, South African Qualification Authority Act of uh, 95 of 1995, of 58 of 1995 which was gazetted in gazette number 1521 uh, in uh, October 4, 1995. So it's something that is within the government uh, gazette, and that is why uh, it, it, the implementation and its facilitation, it gives us those guidelines uh, to work with as institutions, as well as individuals, because if you are doing something that is not within the NQF, you always ask yourself whether is it uh, relevant or not relevant. And then within the NQF, there are a number of qualifications that have been created in order to combine uh, a, a number of learning outcomes uh, for a certain purpose in order to allow us to learn and also to gain some competencies within a, a certain field or certain discipline that uh, we fall under in order to be able maybe at the end to be uh, qualified in a certain uh, skill because we have this particular qualification, but that particular qualification is within the NQF uh, framework. And at the, at the same time, there are relevant bodies uh, that are within SACWA. When we talk of relevant bodies, we those relevant bodies are those who are within maybe a certain field of study or a certain discipline, because we might find there's uh, health, there's, uh, there's uh, commerce, uh, whatever qualification is fall under certain uh, relevant bodies uh, that defines them. And then uh, the NQF challenges the traditional concept of curriculum development as perceived in South African context, in that it separates out the three parts, the setting of standard, the design, the delivery, and the assessment thereof. So you can see right at the end, we have assessment, uh, because within the NQF, there are standards that are set, and the design of the qualification, you find it on the NQF uh, document, which is controlled by so those are some of the uh, key differences or some of the important terms that you must take note of when looking into um, your NPF. And then maybe you can also ask, uh, answer the question of what is the purpose uh, of uh, NQF? You say that it combines education and training into a single framework which brings together uh, 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 and separates education and training system into single and national system. You find that with the NQF, NQF level one is more on GETC, whereby there is education and training that takes place in that level, which means with the national system of South Africa, we know exactly if we are doing NQF level one and qualification and we know exactly in terms of where in which level it has in terms of contributing 
into the world of work and also in terms of contributing into the opportunities that are available within uh, South Africa, if I may say. And it also makes it easier for learners to enter education and training system uh, to move and progress within it. If you already completed your diploma, automatically the NQF uh, uh, align you to move on to another uh, articulation, uh, which is above a certain diploma that you have uh, 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 obtained, which means that is the easier access uh, 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 into education because you already hold a certain status to say that I have this particular NQF and then I can move on to another because I've, I, 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 I'm holding a certain level already. And sometimes it comes with respect because uh, if let's say you have a certain big qualification, you also get access to other uh, avenues of education because of that, because you can progress, you can move within the NPS. Improve the quality of education and training in South Africa. Imagine if there is no NPF uh, level, uh, any institution can decide to say that I'm offering this and then this is a degree, this is a diploma. But with regards to NPF, all qualifications need to be registered and need to be aligned with certain maybe unit standard, uh, which is registered within the SACWA, uh, within SACWA, which makes the quality of education uh, get evaluated by a certain body that uh, control that particular firm. Uh, open up learning and work opportunities for those who were treated unfairly in the past because of their race or gender. So now it's not about a certain color, it's all about are you in a correct NQF or not? So if you, you are in a correct uh, NQF, it's a prerequisite to move to another NQF. It doesn't look uh, into what race or gender are you. You just move on and access to what uh, you are supposed to access. And then we learn us to develop to their full potential. So it's up to you. Uh, if you push yourself, you can push yourself up, you, up until you become a doctor in a particular a professional body that you fall under. So that is the, the purpose of the NQF. And it also has its objectives. Uh, the first objective, you find them in the SACWA Act of 1995, whereby they say create an integrated national framework for learning achievement and it enhances the quality of education. It facilitates access, mobility, and progress. I think we mentioned that in the purpose as well. It isolates the, the risk threat of past unfair discrimination in education. We mentioned that as well. It contributes to the full personal development of each learner. So it's up to you if you want to push yourself and to get access based on the, the NPF uh, that you hold, you can move on the ladder up until you reach the end. So this is the structure of the NPF. Uh, it got cut off, it goes up to NPF level 10, whereby in the NPF level one, you find your grade nine or up at level four, uh, which is GETC uh, qualification. This is the level. Why this is here and it's recognized at this level, when people are doing the up at program, they get to Malusi certificate and all that is done in accordance with the registered uh, 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 qualification ID that they 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 they, they learn under, and then in this stage, that is where you find your grade 10, 11, and 12. You find in a Tibet your NCV level two, level three, level four, where they deal with the national certificate. In the occupational program, you find there are qualifications as well that are within that level, and then from there you go to the post metric where you start to look into your national certificate and you move up with the degrees, diplomas, up until you reach the, 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 the doctoral uh, level of your qualification. Uh, moving along, and then within the NQF uh, uh, National Qualification Framework, there are level descriptors. What do we mean by that? Uh, within the level, there are statements in terms of uh, indicating 
the learning that is appropriate for that particular level. Like, for example, when we go back to the previous slide, the learning that is taking place here, not the same as the learning that is taking place in the uh, FET uh, section. And the learning that is taking place here is different as you go along. It might happen as in the level of GETC, the main aim maybe is to uh, give a, a learner some understanding of a particular field. And then as you move along, they start maybe doing some research, they embark on maybe applying knowledge. Those are level descriptors that are, comes with a different level that um, each NQF level encompasses. So it's also very important to understand the level descriptors for your level. Let's say you are doing maybe a postgraduate uh, diploma or a degree or honors or whatsoever. What level descriptor that defines you that? That is why you see when you go to a postgrad, you start to be introduced maybe on research. And then on the master's level, you start to conduct and it's part and parcel of that qualification to do research rather than maybe on the honors, on the postgrad, they are introduced on the methodology to conduct those research. So the level descriptor defines what is expected, what type of learning is expected from that particular level. And then maybe uh, if we move on, what is the relationship? between the NQF and the outcome-based education. So when you're looking at the qualification and standard registered on the NQF, are described in terms of the specific learning outcomes that the, quali that the qualifying learner is expected to demonstrate. So within the NQF, you'll find the learning outcomes for the particular course, for the particular program. Maybe it can be called a module sometimes, but those, those modules have outcomes, but those outcomes are registered within the NQF. That is why there's a relationship between the outcome-based education and the NQF, because whatever is taught, those outcomes are registered in the NQF. That is why there's this process of accreditation and all that to make sure that whatever you teach someone is something that is registered within the NQF um, framework. The outcome-based education means clearly focusing and organizing everything in an educational system around what is essential for all students to be able to do successfully at the end of their learning experiences. So when you're looking at the outcome-based education, which is the system, educational system, it takes what is registered on the NPF and implement it to students uh, so that those outlined and registered NPF um, or, or outcomes on the NPF are, are done uh, in accordance with the system of education, which is the outcome based assessment, which means the NPF and the outcome based education work hand in hand. Work hand in hand. And then maybe you'll ask yourself, what does SAKWA now? Where is SAKWA? Because SAKWA is more like the qualifications authority that is in South Africa, which, which manages the NPF or which uh, deals with the, the process of NPF. And then within SAKWA, there would be a SAKWA document that gets produced through the registration of those outcomes. When you're looking at the SAKWA document, it comes with these headings. You need to understand these headings when you are studying a certain uh, qualification or certain uh, course that you uh, embark on. Like it would have a title whereby it defines the area of knowledge, understanding, and skill. Like, for example, the title of the course that you are doing right now is the outcome based um, assessment. That is the type. It should have a registration number, which is a SAQA, which means it was registered within SAQA. It must also indicate the level of NQF that I just spoke about. 
what level that you does it fit in, and also look at the credit. How many credits? A uh, credit are linked to hours that um, one need to spend on a particular learning. So the registration within SACWA, it also calculates how long you should take to do the, the, the course. Like for, 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 for our assessor course, we have 15 credits. So if you have 15 credits, it means that for one credit credit, it is equal to 10 notional hours of learning, which means if it's uh, 15 credits, you say 10 times 15. So for this course, you need to spend at least 150 hours of learning. So now you can calculate how many days you should spend uh, on this course learning about it. So we have like 24 hours. It, that is like a, a day and night. Okay, let's say eight hour, or 10 hours in a day. So if you say 10 times 15, uh, that's more like two weeks, three weeks of some sort. So that is why I said five days, I'll give you this content. And then another 25 days you spend on trying to put together, you complete the document and you also uh, work on your portfolio that I will teach you. And then also have field and subfield of the unit standard. Where does it belong to which discipline, which, which uh, field? Is it commerce? Is it science? Is it business studies? Is, is it whatever? Is it insurance? Is it finance? So in this section, it determines where it, uh, where it falls under. When it was issued, which means it, the SACWA has issued it for South Africa, uh, South Africans to use it. And maybe when it was reviewed, maybe after five years, it gets reviewed. Maybe you, 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 you are familiar with the way it whereby a course is being phased out. That is the stage where uh, the, the, the program is issued and the timeline for the particular program, according to SACWA, it has ended. And then the institution will start to phase it out because the SACWA document says that this course expires after five years. And then after five years, the institution will start to phase it out uh, because the time uh, for that particular course has elapsed. And the purpose of the unit standard and the learning assumed to be in place, specific outcomes, all these headings you need to look at when you are looking at a particular qualification as a whole or a particular unit standard. All right. Um, I just uh, said that let me just do a screenshot of the SACWA documents that I was explaining so that it would make sense. Maybe you have come across this particular document. When you Google, uh, the the course that you are doing maybe you go and say conduct outcome based assessment and then you click google and then it will keep give you a link to SACWA document and then you'll find it so we, we said it should have a SACWA id the title uh, the originator who started it uh, the primary uh, or is, which board does it belong to this one belong under HTTP CIFA. Maybe they created it and they submitted under uh, to SACWA. And some subfields, all education and training, different uh, fields, uh, higher education and training. Also, uh, look at this. The band is undefined, uh, unit standard type, the level five. Uh, credits is 15 credits. Uh, maybe you can also ask a question is it still valid? Uh, this particular qualification or this particular unit standard that you're doing, that is where you look at. They are saying the last date for enrollment, because I'm going to enroll you on a sister system, is 30 June 2024. So after this time, we will not be allowed to enroll a student, or maybe we can give, we can be given by sister the grace period to say, I, you can continue up until December, but according to SACWA, uh, by 30 June, no enrollment for this particular assessor course. And the last day for achievement, whereby 
we can enroll someone now and then you take longer to complete it. We have up until 2027, uh, but this is a unit standard. Maybe if it was a degree, uh, you, you can see it more like three years. They give you like uh, three years to complete that particular qualification. Let's say there's a diploma uh, having these uh, enrollment dates. So the last day maybe is the uh, is, is second semester next year, the, this year. And those people, they need to make sure by 2027 they are done. But for this one, because it's fixed, it's a unit standard with uh, 15 credits. You can just do it maybe in a month and then uh, do the processes of CETA and then we give you uh, your statement of results that you are competent or you are not competent. And then maybe some more explanation in terms of what is outcome-based education, uh, is qualification and standard registered on the MQF are described in terms of learning outcome that the qualifying learner is expected to have demonstrated, hence there's an underlying commitment to a system of education and training that is organized around the notion of learning outcome. Like I said, uh, lately we are looking at the learning outcomes in terms of what was intended to be taught. Uh, have you uh, achieved? Have we achieved it? Uh, and then we assess that uh, through outcome based assessment. And then maybe we get to compare what is the traditional approach of. Um, learning with this new uh, outcome-based education and training system, maybe you might find some comparison whereby uh, they say that uh, the difference in quality with the past uh, system, whereby you find that in other institutions, they have a course that has good quality and in other uh, institutions, they have a, a course that have poor quality. It will depend on maybe the developers for that particular qualification uh, might be dominant with maybe uh, other races uh, are, are doing well as compared to other races in terms of uh, their understanding of uh, uh, development of uh, program. But now with the outcome-based system, it's the national quality assurance, which means there is no uh, qualification that is owned by a certain individual who has a better understanding. We, we all do uh, qualifications that are within uh, the National Quality Assurance, which is controlled by SACWA, as we mentioned. And this one focuses on input in terms of what a teacher has taught a learner. But when you're looking at the outcome page, you're looking at what a learner uh, has learned, the output of uh, learning rather than the input. Because in the past, the teacher was banking the information, but currently students are working towards achieving the, 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 the outcome. No national standards, but in this instance now, registered national standards. So these are the comparison, and you can look uh, at them and then see the differences um, as you go along. And then maybe we, we, we can go away from uh, talking more about outcome based, the SAQA, NQF, maybe start looking into what is RPL. Because if you are an assessor, you assess normal students who enroll and also uh, sit down, attend classes, and then at the end, you, you, you assess them and you deem them whether they are competent or they are not competent. Or you might find someone who have certain experience, uh, qualification skills obtained from maybe a uh, somewhere, but seem to be relevant to the offering uh, that the particular institution is, is offering. And then that person has to undergo the, the new concept, which is called the recognition of prior learning. We believe that you have learned and we need to recognize it by verifying those skills and abilities through assessing uh, them. So the definition of recognition of prior learning is, is, is referring to the process uh, of verification of skills. You might have skills that you already have, like you are already a mechanic, you can 
uh, fix the car, things like that. Uh, you might have knowledge gained somewhere. You might have abilities or attributes obtained, maybe through training, maybe through other education, or maybe through workplace experience or life experience. Maybe sh that life experience you share uh, with maybe your your parents or someone who's older with a master of a certain skill, but then there is no formal setting that you have set down and you have learned that particular skill to make it recognized in a manner that can allow you to get a job. So that is where RPL, uh, RPL came into being in terms of recognizing that. So uh, again, they also say that uh, RPL is a valid concept considering that the way individuals learn and develop is not necessarily only in the lecture or classroom, which means RPL, it doesn't only focusing on what you have learned in your classroom, but it looks at other avenues that you have gained the knowledge. Like many adults have developed very useful skills through work experience or other exposure to deny this development and competence uh, in South Africa now, it is recognized as unfair. So that is why they have uh, uh, created this new concept of recognition of prior learning. So the principle of RPL has been included in the NQF, which means if it has been included in the NQF, which means it has uh, been registered. So if I can go back in, in, um, in this document here, uh, this, this document here. So when you look at this document, right at the bottom of the outcome, it will also talk about the recognition of prior learning in terms of how to recognize the prior learning that an individual has obtained somewhere. Make, let me give you a typical example. Uh, earlier on, I mentioned that maybe uh, the DPE section, they rely mostly on what the person has done on the PGCE, or maybe one has done on the um, on their BFD degree. And then there's a, a, a module that talks to assessment. And then if one will say, uh, Keta Training, can you please recognize uh, my prior learning on assessment with regards to assessor course. And then they produce evidence of their academic transcript that talks to assessment. And then CATA training as an institution, because they are accredited with this unit standard, they need to conduct the, the RPS. And uh, which means within the criteria that would be set by the institution, in order to recognize RPL, there are certain things that we'll ask. Maybe we'll ask a person to prepare a certain portfolio to give us some evidence of what they know with regards to this particular outcome-based assessment. And then we'll also ask them maybe to conduct an assessment to see if they can use the outcome-based assessment to conduct an assessment. Mind you, there was no classroom teaching that as a facilitator, I will do with that particular individual. But what I will do, I will just engage with the assessment to recognize prior learning, which is guided by this particular SACWA document. So therefore, the, 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 the RPL is also uh, registered within the, the NQF do, do, document, which means uh, SACWA tells institutions who are accredited, please recognize uh, those individuals who have obtained uh, knowledge through maybe work or maybe through their previous training or maybe through their life experience. So the process of RCL as, as well get assessed because you have to assess a person that you really, really have that skill which means there is a, a, an assessment that will be prepared for the individual to prove that they have knowledge and skills for that particular uh, 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 
particular knowledge or skill. And then the purpose of RPL, it allows accelerated access to further learning. So the individual did not have a qualification, but then they came to the institution, got access, and they passed the assessment and they get a certificate. If they get a certificate that is within NPF, they start to progress to further learning because now they have something that is recognized. And another important uh, purpose assesses and give credit for evidence because you already know something, which means when you get access, you get credit. For this particular course, it's 15 credits. If someone comes with evidence and we assess that person, that person will get credit. And identifying what the learner knows and what the learner can do, matching the learner skills, knowledge, and experience to specific standards and the associated criteria. And it also assesses the learner against those standards. You don't just give a person a certificate because they have prior knowledge. No, you, they also have to go through a certain assessment. The only difference is that we don't teach them because we believe they have already obtained that particular knowledge somewhere. So now they just need to be assessed to see if they are competent or not, and then they get credited in a manner that would be recognized. And then crediting the learner for skills, that is very important as well. And the question maybe we might come across is that, who qualifies for RPL? Okay, before I comment, uh, Ryan, uh, you have something to ask or, or say? Uh, yeah, so, um, so this RPL, you know, yeah. when I first got, when I first actually realized about this RPL, and it seemed so difficult, it's, it's last year when, when students were supposed to apply for RPL, especially the students that were busy, that were already lecturing. So they, mm. they, they felt like they already have the teaching experience that we still need to go and yeah. uh, acquire. And some of them, they felt like they are lecturers already. They just lack the qualification. Yeah. So, yeah. so, but Stadio made it seem so difficult. Why did they make it so difficult? Why that? Why did they create an impression that it's difficult to apply for RPL? Because the way you explain it here now, it mm. it does not seem to be that difficult as it was last year. People were waiting, yeah. and people were they were so frustrated around this RPL thingy. And 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 and, and according to how you explain it now, it's not supposed to be that difficult. They are supposed to just assess you. You tell them, this is what I am. This is what I do. I've been doing it for this long. And then they have to mm. assess you and see yeah. that what you are saying, is it true? So why mm. did they make it so difficult? I can't speak for other people, <laughs> but the, the, the normal issue with RPL is that it's more like it's a new, I can't use the word it's a new concept because it's been there. It's just that uh, most institutions, they, they haven't introduced it because they take it as it's hard, like you are saying. So in order for me to assess you using RPL, I need to have clear criteria to use in order to assess you. And again, some, they feel it's hard to go through RPL. Some institutions make it hard because they don't want to disadvantage those guys who would spend maybe, if you're talking about the university, some students would spend six months doing a program, a subject, but you would just come and do one assessment and go. So if it's easy, it's like you just uh, grab it and go. And then within a, a RPL, the criteria has to cover the outcome as well. Because let us say we have an outcome to conduct, like for this uh, particular uh, 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 course we are doing right now. I mentioned five uh, outcomes that you, you need to learn, which means when you assess someone RPL, all the outcomes must be assessed. 
so that that particular individual will be granted in confidence that they qualify for that particular certificate or for that particular uh, module that they would be exempted or that they would be they would get credit of so sometimes those delays you see on institution is trying to get a clear criteria number one and also trying to get individuals that are clear with the rpl process and then at the end once that barrier to rpl has been closed it's easy like we are explaining because at the end of the day it's a matter of applying for it uh, being given a, a chance because we can see that there's evidence showing that you can tackle this particular rpl and then we give you the assessment and we mark the assessment and we deem you competent or not competent. Mind you, Ryan, it doesn't mean that as you go through RPL, you'll pass it straight away. It might happen that when I test you, I will see that, yes, you've been uh, in the industry or you've been in a training, uh, you have a knowledge of that. But if I assess, you failed. So it doesn't guarantee a part as well. You have to prove yourself. Uh, like for example, in this particular course, you will design an assessment. If I can create RPL for this, I'll I'll give a, a, that particular person for RPL to design an assessment as well, to show that they know that maybe they've been teaching, assessing, blah, 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 things like that. So that is why it okay. looks so difficult but it's not difficult. It's just that you also need to prove it. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Ryan. Uh, who qualifies? Any individuals who can provide evidence of competence that can be measured and assessed against national standards. Before you go through the process, you must show some evidence that you do have knowledge. I made an example of a PGCE course or a BS if you want to be exempted on education staff that's an evidence. Or maybe if you want to use like the work experience of some sort, you might provide your job profile, explaining your duties that you've been doing this. And then I just need to test you in terms of whether you are you qualified to be credited or not. And then the individual needs to submit a portfolio of various types of evidence, and all evidence must reflect uh, existing experience uh, and should be presented in such a way that it could be assessed against that uh, criteria. Uh, those criteria are created by the institution that is accredited. And when, when one seeks admission to a particular formal education, uh, when one applies for a certain job that requires specific qualification, you go through RPL and then you pass, you gain credit, where when one applies for a qualification on the NQF, you want to enter a, a certain institution and you tell them that I've already done this, they will put you through to RPL. And when one applies for exemption on certain uh, aspects uh, and also is selected for a particular job and has no formal qualification. You, maybe someone has, has been in a job for quite some time, but there's no qualification. And then your organization just tell you that can you please go to KETA training and do uh, RPL so that you come back with the uh, certificate? Uh, colleagues, I think I need to stop here uh, for today so that uh, we will not go beyond the time that we set uh, to make sure that uh, we, we cover as much as uh, is limited to time. So let me just open the floor if you have questions before we close the session. Uh, do you have any questions on your side before I tell you what to do next? Yes, Mapula. Hi, Mr. K. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, is it possible mm. to fail this course or maybe you bring back the file so that I can do it in a correct way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is possible. 
it, it, it is possible to fail uh, because failing is not like, uh, we don't use the word failing in this particular uh, context. Uh, we, we say competent or not yet competent. Your competence is defined by the evidence that you have submitted. So if you submitted insufficient evidence, you may be deemed as uh, not yet competent by the assessor of the of your portfolio. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. K. Mm. And then if I say that you're not yet competent because you did not submit your ID, and then I ask you to submit your ID, and then you meet the criteria, and then we, we resubmit it and say you are competent, and then it move on to another level. Yeah, of, so about uh, the, the documents, Mr. K, how soon do you need them? Should you send them during the week? Yes, please, during the week, because I need to enroll all of you on the CETA system so that you, you saw the date on the SACWA document. We need to do it as soon as possible so that you'll be in the system. If you decide maybe you, you want to drop, you'll be in a system. I'll do justice of enrolling you because you came through and you, 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 it's part of uh, my duty to ensure that you are enrolled. Uh, so that uh, you are there. And as you continue, uh, you submit your portfolio, we assess it. We indicate on the system that Mapule has submitted a portfolio and the assessor has marked it and the assessor deemed Mapule as competent. And then it will move to the moderator. The moderator will check all, the, all, all your files and then moderator will do the same on the system and say, yes, Mapula is competent. After that, it's beyond the control of CETA training as an institution, training provider. We'll invite CETA to come to our offices at Pretoria East, and they will take all your files because we have we, we'll arrange the courier uh, for all the files. And then they'll sit down and open each and everyone's file and see if what we said is competent, true competent. And then you get your, your statement of result uh, from CETA. Hope you answered my pull up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. K. I'll keep on unpacking the processes as we go along. I'll just give bit by bit because of uh, time and all. Uh, with no question, oh, what I need you to do, I need you to look at learning unit uh, one, of which I just explained. Uh, what I did today, I just explained 60% and then there's 40% element that is, uh, that is remaining. So what I will do, this recording, I'll put it on the, uh, uh, where you, you saw the, the material, where you see the recording up until RPL. And then I'll have another piece of recording from RPL to the end of the, of the unit. And then you start working on your workbook of your learning unit one. Please look at it and then start answering the questions there because it will ask for your insight of what I've just said. Maybe to ask you, what are you thinking about the SACWA? Do you think it's the right system or not? And then you start talking about it uh, based on your learner, uh, learner guide, uh, explaining SACWA and based on the, the slide uh, that talks to them. The slide for this particular unit it's also available on your document there uh, for you to look at. But I will continue to unpack it up until the end. And then tomorrow we'll look at another one. So that is your homework for, for, for tomorrow, like when you get a chance. And if let's say you don't have time because I'm dealing with others, which means you know that you are owing the uh, Monday work that needs to be done on Tuesday, don't allow it to pile up because it's going to end up being too much. So if you get a chance, just look at that and try and answer that. Or maybe if you want to print it, you can print that unit of your workbook and start uh, answering those um, particular questions. As you move along, you move along up until the end of the week, you'll be done with your, 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 your workbook to prepare yourself for a summative assessment.
So can I call it a night? Uh, I hope to see you tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we can start early because I have some commitment with uh, one of the presentation today. Uh, it's finished a bit late. Okay, we can start at six o'clock if the house agrees, or we can start at half past six, six like we did today. It's fine. Are we on for six o'clock or half past six tomorrow? Six o'clock is okay. Six o'clock. Six o'clock is fine for me too. I'll also do a confirmation uh, via this SMS portal I used to reach you just to uh, uh, ensure that whoever maybe is out on, on this meeting now get the message that we're starting at I, I wanted to ask, sir, did you say there's a soft copy of the workbook as well? Yes, there's a soft copy. If it's not on what I shared with you, I'll double check just now, Ryan, and make it available. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thanks, sir. Thank, thank you so much and enjoy your evening. Yeah? All right, thanks. Bye. Bye.